So um, next up we have um, Julia. I'm not going to try to mangle your last names, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> but she'll be speaking on balancing efficiency and standardization for a microscopic um, image repo on a high uh, HPC system. So let's, uh, Julia. <laughs> Where is the HDMI cable? Oh, it's here. Yeah. If I can try it. This works. No. Then we just put it that way. That looks better. Now it works. Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Julia. I'm a software developer at the Institute of Neurosciences and Medicine at the Forschungszentrum in Jülich. And today I would like to show you how we are trying to build a large-scale image repository for our microscopic uh, image data on an HPC system and how we are also using DataLab for that. And um, I want to especially focus on the challenges we've been facing and on the solutions we came up with and there is still some stuff to discuss. So I would like to start my talk, it's very nice that you introduced me, Joey, by your post <laughs> on Fostodon, uh, that you found it wild that there are people uh, dealing with two petabytes of data and using Git Annex. So nice to meet you, that's us. <laughs> yeah. So who is us? Uh, we are the Big Data Analytics Research Group at the Institute of Neurosciences and Medicine, which is led by Katrin Amunds, and our research group is led by Timo Dickscheid. And as the name already tell tells, we are dealing with big data. So what are we really doing with such huge amounts of data? Um, at our institute, we are studying the structural and functional organization of the human brain. And to facilitate this research, we are building um, in our research group a multi-level human brain atlas. If you scan the QR code, you can have a look at it. Um, and uh, what is an atlas? So we have a 3D um, high resolution model of a human brain that we reconstructed and we are spatially linking uh, data to this uh, model which is uh, of multi modes. So we have different modalities and uh, of multi resolution. So we have very high resolution but also low resolution data. And now the question is, of course, how do we organize this data? How can we share it with others? And that's what I want to talk about now. So to achieve getting this uh, beautiful atlas, we are taking post-mortem human brains and we are cutting them into thin slices. And these slices are then um, digitized with these, do you see my mouse? Yes, um, high throughput scanners. And uh, we have about 7,000 sections for one brain. And then each scanner outputs uh, 29 TIFF files uh, for each section, uh, which uh, represents a focus level. So we have different focus levels for one section, which then results in set about two petabytes of data per brain with about 200,000 files. And we are currently scanning about one brain per year, so we have a lot of data <laughs> that we want to share with the world. So what are we doing with this data? On one hand, we are analyzing this data with uh, HPC algorithms, so computer vision and AI, to extract information, for example, cell densities or brain regions. But we also want to make it accessible remotely, so for people to look at it, so what you are looking at now if you scan the QR code, but also to share it with others, for example, through platforms like Omero, Jülich Data, eBrains, whatever. So now the question is, how get, do we get from the left side to the right side, and how can we efficiently organize, store, and handle this kind of data? So um, to answer this question, at least partly, I will present the steps that our data goes through from left to right and which solutions we came up with for the challenges we were facing. So as I already said, um, we have a lot of data to make it a bit more 
yeah, uh, understandable. It's uh, about 17 sections per day, which sounds not that much, but it's five terabytes of data that we're producing in one day. So it's really a lot. And um, our first challenge is, of course, we want to have it on an HPC storage so we can analyze it and also share it. And now the question is, how do we transport it even from the scanners to the HPC storage uh, quite robustly so nothing gets lost? Um, that is our first challenge that we were facing and currently we are using fast data transfer, FDT and RSync, which um, proved to be quite robust. We are also thinking about only using RSync because it is a bit faster and yeah, I mean you cannot use an FSS, NFS mount simply and move data there, that's too slow. So RSync was our solution. Now. When we move our data, it first goes to a gateway server where we do automatic quality control to check if the quality of the data is good enough. If it's not, it will be rescanned. And we also organize our data into folders so that we have the 29 TIFF files in one folder for one uh, brain section. And what we want to have there is we want to track the software that we did the automatic quality control mit with and uh, we want to version our data because if we do a rescan that's a new version of the file for us. Now the question is how can we track provenance and versions for such big data? You guessed it, we use DataLed for that. <laughs> so we are have set up a DataLed to, um, so we have one data set as one section and we are tracking everything with that. Now we are moving that to the HPC storage using rsync and now there are some specialties about HPC storage. So it's a multi-tier GPFS file system. What does that mean? So multi-tier means we have different partitions on the file system with different characteristics. So we have a partition that is, uh, has very fast I.O. access but lower capacity. This is used for really the analysis part, so data can only be accessed on these partitions by the compute nodes. But we also have parts that have um, high capacity, lower I.O. rate, which can be used, for example, for the remote access, which doesn't need to be that fast. Now the question is, how do we make the data available on these different partitions? Of course, just copying everything on every partition um, doesn't make sense for more than two petabyte of data. So we are simply um, using, uh, so it's called staging if you put the data on the different partitions. We're also using DataLed for that, so we simply clone the data to the partition that we need it at. We just get the data that we need there for our computation, and after that we drop it and everything is free of space again, um, because otherwise the storage admins would kill me <laughs> if we would copy everything. Okay, um, now the second point is GPFS. So at GPFS, we are limited in the number of inodes because if there are too many inodes, the file system gets slow and nobody can compute anything anymore. So we really try to minimize the inode usage. That is our next challenge, if it pops up. Yes, and now if you think about a normal data-led repository and Git Annex, you know that there are links from the file to the Git Annex and this is already two inodes per one file, which is, of course, for these amounts of data, too much. So we really struggled how we can solve this. We also used RIA stores, but then we had a discussion with Michael and he came up with the best solution. So now we are, it's really great that you talked about it today. So we are using DataLed Annex, so these special URLs, which produce only two files for the DataLed repository, which can be extracted from there, and um, an anchor special remote. So we only tell DataLed at this URL on the file system, you can find the file that I want to get now. So we have only the data itself, so 29 files plus two files for the data set, which is very nice, and the storage admins love me now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that problem is also solved. Very great. Um, right, 
So now we are already at the last part of our plan and there we still have some difficulties. So provenance tracking can of course be done with DataLet as I already explained, but we have a problem with um, accessing the data. So we need fast parallel random I.O. for the HPC analysis and fast random access for visualization. And the file format that we are currently using, the TIFF format, is not really good for that because it doesn't allow parallel I.O. So we are currently converting to HDF5. So we have currently duplication of data. Don't say it too loud. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's of course not a solution for, for the long time. So we are thinking about converting our data to HDF5 beforehand, but then we have a different conflict because we also want to comply to community standards, of course, when we want to share the data. And community standards, for example, in our case, it would also be the BIT standard, imply five formats. And HDF5 is not a part of this standard. So to comply to the standard, we cannot use HDF5, but TIFF would be part of the standard, but it's not usable for our efficient computation. So what do we do now? That is the problem we're trying to solve at the moment. So our plan is also after discussions with Michael to store the data in the format that we can use for our computation, regardless of any standards. And whenever somebody requests our data for sharing, for looking at it, then we transform it on the fly to the standard we want to deliver it in. So if somebody wants to have it in bits format, then we provide a mapping from our file structure and file format to the standard that the person wants to have. So these would be, these are still in discussion. These would be ideas that we came up with to solve this conflict that we have. Okay, now I want to summarize that again. So our first problem was how can we transfer our data in a robust way across different file systems with high throughput so that the scanner's storage doesn't um, get like full. <laughs> um, so we are using mainly rsync for provenance and versioning tracking on HPC system, which also includes the inode problematic and the staging. We are using DataLet with DataLet Annex and Anchor Special Remote, so we only have as few inodes as possible. Also, if we would be using HDF5, we could also minimize inodes even more because we could put all 29 images into one file. Um, but of course, there we have the conflict with the standards that wouldn't be um, bits conform. So what we thought about is store it in the format that is efficient for us for um, computation and then serve it on the fly as the standard that people need. Yeah, that's already it. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. And I also like to hear opinions, experiences with whatever. I, I guess I can, it's more of a comment than a question. This is just amazing. <laughs> um. <laughs> One question about that inode issue. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate more? What, what is that uncurl? Uncurl is an application or? Um, uncurl is, I mean, Michael can explain that a bit better, I think. Um, so we just tell DataLet, we give DataLet a URL, so we register for every key in the Git Annex a URL on the file system, so it's like file dash dash, and then we point to the um, location where it is, and then I think that is the thought behind this anchor special remote that it, oh, via this URL, it can find the data without having to, uh, you yeah. know. So, I mean, how, how can it decrease the number of inodes? That is not clear to me. Because, what is the... so usually you would have the data in the Git Annex, right? And you have a link to the data. So these would be two inodes. Mm -hmm. Now we only have the data itself. I mean, if you clone, of course, you get these links again. But for long-term storage, 
as long as nobody wants to clone the data at the moment, you have a decreased number of inodes. Yeah, maybe just add uh, to that. The, uh, the only thing that this uncurl thing does, which is it's a git annex special remote, and it allows you to basically flexibly define the, the, the organization of the storage. Right? And they don't need uh, the, the, the full annex tree and the capability to represent whatever. Right? They, they want to have the least possible. And, and so with uncurl, uncurl is basically an availability information recycler. So it will uh, construct the URL where to get things from based on everything it knows about from Git Annex of that key. So the key name, you know, any sort of URL components that, it, that exist. Right. So that's basically it. Yeah, just on that same question. So does it decrease the number of inodes by about half? Or is it, is it? I think it's even more, because if you think about which folders and files there are also in the .datalet.git repository, this is all gone. So I think it's even more. I, I don't have numbers, to be honest. But I think it's more than, it must be more than uh, double the size, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience. Well. Okay, um, somebody, or from the internet, someone has asked, um, when sharing the data in other formats, um, e.g. bids compliant, how much data are we talking? Is it always the two petabytes per brain? So we are not yet at the stage that we are able to share the data like we want to have it, but it could also be only one section or a range of sections, so it's not always the two petabytes. So you can always have also a subset of that or pick sections from different brains or whatever you need. Or maybe also just parts of a section, depending, yeah. Well, one other question. For, for petabytes of data, there is, a, there is an issue when you want to display the status of data. Like petabytes of data, it, takes, it can take like 30 minutes for one petabyte or two petabytes. Did you have any idea to handle this issue? What do you mean by just, the status? Just data lab the data? status or git annex a status when you this command. So mm -hmm. simple simple command. It can take like thirty minutes or more than that for petabytes of data. Did okay. you have any idea for that? Yeah, so we we didn't try that yet. <laughs> so um we are we are still in the process of building that for so we already have data which is in RIA stores, but we want to transform it to the new uncurl thing, so we don't have two petabytes of data in, in this setup that I presented yet. So we would still need to have a look at that then. So no, I don't have a solution for that yet. Maybe just a, a small addition. Technically, the runtime shouldn't depend on the size exactly, but the number of files, and more importantly, possibly the number of sub data sets you have. So it's not it's not storage size that, that matters. Uh, you can, yeah, okay. Okay, I think um, we'll just um, break. Well, we're going to move into the panel now, so we'll have more time for more questions. But if uh, if Nell would like to come back up to the stage, we'll. Uh, also, one comment. Yeah. So we have one data set uh, for one section, so we don't have a whole data set for the whole two petabytes. So it's only a section that we would look at always. <laughs> 